Could you talk about cell phone usage during the retreat? It's distracting when I see people doing it and I'm saddened by their addictions to their devices. <laughs> On the plus side, it's making me do a lot of loving kindness meditation. <laughs> So if you see somebody else using their phone, come and let me know and I'll confiscate their phone. Um, I already caught one person using their phone and I let that person off too easily. I should have taken their phone away right away. Um, but from, and, and seriously, there's, there's a day and a half left in retreat. You really can go a day and a half without using your phone. If you think you can't go a day and a half without using your phone, you really need to seek professional help. <laughs> like, seriously, that is just so far beyond the limits. I mean, this, this retreat is it's less than a week. I mean, I went without a phone for eight years, and I was perfectly fine. <laughs> and I don't know what you're talking about when you say off hours. We don't have off hours. We have group practice time and personal practice time. <laughs> okay. Next one. Ooh, diagrams. Um, this says. Thank you for your teaching on the non-existence of objects and the lump of foam simile. I thought the simile was remarkably similar to Stephen Hawking's theory of dark matter. Have you heard the connection made before? To think the Buddha made an observation of foam about 2,600 years ago to explain how most or all objects are mostly made up of nothing could be seen as the backbone of Stephen Hawking's breakthrough in theoretical physics about 20 years ago blows me away. Thoughts? Foam slash dark matter diagram on back. To be perfectly honest, I don't know enough about Stephen Hawking's theory of dark matter to talk about it. Other people who know much more about quantum physics and such things have made some connections. Uh, the most well-known book that I'm aware of is called The Quantum and the Lotus. Um, and uh, I think uh, Venerable Mathieu Ricard is the one who presented the Buddhist angle in that book. Um, you're familiar with that book? You're familiar with it? Uh, well, no, it's not your part. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I personally don't know enough about quantum physics to talk about it. Um, though, again, the, the Buddha's point is about the simultaneous existence and non-existence of all things about how things being simultaneously existent and non-existent is why it has the appearance of being real, the appearance of being solid, when actually it's not solid. So his, his point of using a lump of foam is not because of its apparent resemblance to uh, physical theories, but rather because a lump of foam is something that appears solid but is not solid at all. So I think it might be a bit of a stretch. Uh, so I have heard some other people make connections saying like, oh, foam is mostly air, and physicists also say that atoms are mostly air, therefore the Buddha was talking about atoms. But no, that's not accurate. Um, because that would still be saying that there was something actually real there. It was just mostly air with a small amount of real things. Uh, which would not match with what the Buddha was saying. The Buddha is saying is that there's nothing there that's absolutely real. So even the nucleus of an atom is still <coughs> simultaneously existent and non-existent. Okay. This one says, I know a few Brahma Vihara meditations, a few concentration practices, and a couple insight meditations. How do I know when to use what? Generally speaking, my choice is based on what I need to bring. Excuse me. 
My choice is based on what I need to bring about, equanimity and or the cessation of anger or craving. I'm not seeking enlightenment specifically. <laughs> Why are you here? <laughs> so this is Buddhist insights. So Buddhist, uh, Buddhism literally means the practice of enlightenment. So Buddha means the enlightened one. Uh, so Buddhism, the practice of enlightenment. That's what it's all about. Buddhism is all about attaining enlightenment. So that's why this place exists. It's why these retreats happen. It's to help people attain enlightenment. So I would encourage you to reconsider um, you're not seeking enlightenment. <laughs> As to what practices to use, how do, how do I know when to use what? Uh, you have to feel your mind and determine what's going to be most beneficial at this time. Um, and try things out and see what happens and see what's working and see what's not working. Uh, what's working, run with it. What's not working, uh, adjust your approach till it works. Um, or if it's really not working at all, try something different. Uh, the one thing I would say is, one, don't neglect loving-kindness meditation. It's really, really important. Um, I've known far too many meditators who neglect loving-kindness meditation, and you can tell because they're jerks. <laughs> <laughs> don't be one of those. Um, so don't neglect loving-kindness meditation, and also at least every once in a while, develop the perception of impermanence. Even if it's just for a few minutes, bring it up once in a while, because over time it starts to change things. It really does make... Again, in the beginning it seems difficult, or it seems absurd, or it seems silly, but you just... You just do it, and you do it, and you do it, and then eventually something starts to shift. The way we perceive our body starts to shift. The way we perceive our mind starts to shift. Um, and it's hard to define exactly what the shift is like, but it's kind of like a feeling of safety starts to come up. And I don't know exactly how to describe that. There's something about it when we start to recognize that all things are constantly changing, and I don't mean as an idea, I mean as an experience. When we start to recognize that as an experience, then we start to realize that there's absolutely nothing that can harm us. So this feeling of safety comes up. And also the mind naturally leans towards non-attachment, uh, and therefore towards happiness and contentment. So, do at least once in a while, do some perception of impermanence. I remember when I first heard about it, I was like, oh, I'll get around to that at some point. <laughs> and then years later, I was like, maybe you should actually try this out. And I tried it out a little bit, and I was like, well, that was kind of dumb, and put it down again. Right. And then, a while later, I was like, this is something the Buddha really emphasized. It's all over the suttas. It's not something we can ignore. It's not something we can set lightly aside. It's something that we really do need to investigate. So I devoted more time to it, and as I devoted more time to it, I started to notice, one, when you spend time with it, it becomes extremely interesting. Like, it will radically transform the way you experience the world. Uh, but also, I started to notice this, this feeling of, of safety and security and contentment that comes along with it. And it's counterintuitive. You wouldn't think that perceiving everything as insubstantial would make you feel safe, but it does. <coughs> you wouldn't think that perceiving the simultaneous <coughs> existence and non-existence of things would make you happy, but it does. So try it out, see what happens. 
And of course, uh, its power depends upon mindfulness and concentration. So really make a sincere effort to develop some mindfulness and concentration. Let's see. This one says, so much pain. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to samsara. <laughs> you just discovered the nature of samsara. My whole body hurts pretty much all the time. Ouch. However, I have made huge progress sitting still with it. For the first time ever, I can sit still for the duration of the longer sits. Yay me! <laughs> I have just accepted that it's going to hurt and alternate between metta and watching it change. This is big. My question is, my brain is telling me that something in my knee is going to snap. <laughs> like it feels like a, a tendon or a ligament is going to pop. Is that possible? <laughs> Should I move mindfully if the pain is that intense, or do I just keep sitting? <laughs> just keep sitting. If you hold still, nothing is going to happen. What? Uh, the problem arises actually not when we're holding still, but when we move. So we might be sitting still for a long period of time. And then when we go to sit up, we jerk really quickly. That's when you can actually hurt your legs. So you want to make sure, at the, especially at the end of a long period of meditation, you want to make sure that you move very slowly, very carefully, as you untwist your legs. So not doing any sudden or jerky motions, but doing it very slowly and carefully. Uh, because if you're going to hurt yourself, it's not during the meditation, it's at the end when you're getting up from your meditation. Um, so, but yeah, if you're having pain, you can have, again, I've had experiences during meditation where it felt like I was being stabbed all over my body. Like I had like a hundred crazy little pygmies with knives, like all over my body. And I'm fine. I'm, I'm not bleeding from a hundred little knife cuts. I'm totally okay. My legs still function, well, more or less as well as they did when I was younger. Um, I'm getting old, it's really creepy. <laughs> Seriously, I'm, I, don't, I don't feel that old, but my joints are starting to tell me I'm not as young as I used to be. Anyway, uh, so yeah, don't worry about pain in your knee. Uh, so this whole story about a tendon or ligament going to pop, that's just a story in your mind. It's not real. Uh, the sensation that you're having is just a sensation. Um, so what, what sometimes tends to happen as we develop our, our mindfulness of the body practice uh, is that we start to feel the body very intensely but at first, we automatically associate that intense feeling as pain. It's not pain, it's just an intense feeling. But we, we haven't yet recognized the difference. So we stay with it, we stay with it, we stay with it. And eventually we recognize, oh, this isn't actually pain. It's just a very intense sensation. In the beginning, we can't really tell the difference because we're only really used to intense feelings being either pleasure or pain. So when we start to feel an intense feeling that's not pleasant, we automatically think it's pain. That's not accurate. It's just a, a deluded perception. It's a misperception. So we stay with it and stay with it and stay with it and try, to, uh, try not to get caught up in the story, the story of, I hate this, this is awful, this hurts so bad. Try not to get caught up in the story. Just stay with the sensation. And eventually you'll recognize that the sensation is just an intense, neutral sensation. It's not pain. Pain is just a story that we're adding that doesn't need to be there. So stay with it. I know it hurts. I know it's awful. Stay with it because it changes. Mm -hmm. And if you stay with it until it changes, then you'll have learned an incredibly valuable lesson. Next question. Could you help further define wholesome versus unwholesome? 
As in, on one end of the spectrum, something may be completely wholesome, on the other end, something may be completely unwholesome. In other areas, it may contain elements of both. What I would properly say is that uh, there are individual intentions, and each individual intention is either wholesome or unwholesome, but that an action may contain multiple intentions. So, for example, Drager might be starving, um, and so I'm like, Drager's starving, I want to help him live, so I'm going to give him some food. However, I also secretly have a grudge against Drager, and I know that he's gluten intolerant, so I'm going to give him a sandwich. <laughs> so he'll get some nourishment out of it, but he's not going to enjoy it quite as much as he might like to. So there's a mixed intention here. There's the wholesome intention of wanting to help him survive, mixed with the unwholesome intention of wanting to make him suffer a little bit. So there's two separate distinct intentions here. There's the intention to help him survive, and the intention to make him suffer a little bit. So the action, giving him the sandwich, is an expression of both intentions. So you might say the action is mixed karma, but each individual intention is either clearly wholesome or clearly unwholesome. So that's what I would say. I would not say that there is an intention which is in and of itself mixed but rather something that appears to be mixed rather contains two or more distinct intentions. One of which is wholesome and one of which is unwholesome. So wholesome and unwholesome is actually quite straightforward. Wholesome is wishing benefit for sentient beings. Unwholesome is wishing harm for sentient beings. That's really all it comes down to. The more complicated issue is that indulging in delusion is a form of unwholesome. And so we don't necessarily see the harm right away, but the harm there is that it draws us farther away from awakening. It gets us mired more and more into dream worlds and misperception. And so the more mired we are in delusion, the more likely we are to accidentally cause harm, either to ourselves or to others and also the farther away we are from awakening. Next question. You mentioned a four elements not self meditation. Can we get some of that or can you tell us where to find it? Maybe tomorrow. I think not tonight, but maybe tomorrow. Um, also, which sutta is a good one to start reading first? Are they available online or free? Thanks. Well, I usually recommend starting uh, either with the anthology called In the Buddha's Words, uh, which is a collection of translations by Bhikkhu Bodhi which are arranged thematically. It's meant to be a, a gradual introduction to Buddhism, starting with basic Buddhist concepts, then working up to uh, the path to complete enlightenment. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good selection of suttas to give you a pretty broad overview of the Buddha's teachings. And also the suttas he selected are ones that are fairly easy to get a handle on uh, when you're new to Buddhism. So I would recommend that. Uh, another option that I often recommend is to read the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses from start to finish. That's a bit more of a project because the suttas are in no apparently rational order. So, like, the very first discourse is very profound and very hard to understand if you're not already very familiar with Buddhism. And then the second one is much more practical and easy to understand, and so it's, it's a bit more over all over the map. So, starting with uh, the anthology in the Buddha's words is a good start. Um, the only downside is that it is not a freely available book. Uh, that said, if you contact me after the retreat, I can help you um, see if you can... We might have some extra copies laying around somewhere. It's possible. 
Yeah. Come and check with me. I might be able to help you find one. It says, will the videos be available to watch later? Yeah, they're all stored on the Facebook page. The Buddhist Insights Facebook page has all the videos. As and well we'll as upload them on YouTube in a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is a, a couple of volunteers that are working on migrating everything to YouTube. Uh, it's a big project, so if you want that to happen sooner rather than later, you're welcome to help them out. <laughs> I have noticed the benefits of sitting in traditional postures, though should our practice be just as strong in any posture? Yeah. Next question. <laughs> I noticed one of our retreatants went missing. Is he okay? Sending metta. Um, I actually don't know because he wouldn't tell me why he was leaving and he hasn't responded to my text messages. So I honestly, I don't know what's going on with him. I hope he's okay as well. Yeah. Can you please discuss the term dependent origination? I would like to understand what it means. How much time do you have? <laughs> So I could spend hours and hours and hours and hours talking about dependent origination because it's a, it's a very deep subject with a lot of nuances. But uh, briefly, at the end of the Kachanagota Sutta, you might recall I went through the list uh, from ignorance, uh, or due to ignorance there are uh, conditional formations, due to conditional formations there is consciousness, due to consciousness there is mind and body and so on. That's dependent origination. So there's a few different versions of it that we find in the suttas. The most common version has 12 steps. So starting from ignorance and then going up through uh, birth, decay, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And then uh, 12 steps of cessation. So from the cessation of ignorance then comes the cessation of everything up to the cessation of decay, dying, pain, grief, and despair, and so on. <coughs> Dependent origination, brief, briefly speaking, is <coughs> talking about the causal, conditional basis for all of our experiences. So if you want the simplest form of dependent origination that the Buddha gives, uh, the Buddha said, when this arises, that arises. When this ceases, that ceases. That's it. So the point here is that everything is causal. Everything is dependent upon causes and conditions. Nothing exists of its own accord. Things only exist in relationship to other things. That's dependent origination. Okay? This is something which on its surface looks obvious, but when you consider its implications, it becomes extraordinarily profound. Yeah, I'll, we'll probably do another retreat on it sometime in the next few months, um, because it's a really important topic to develop a deep understanding of. What is the best way to deal with a negative coworker? I'm at a point where I might request to move desks. I know my coworker is lonely and depressed, but her negativity is unbearable at times. Literally everything she says is negative. If she doesn't like her salad or lunch, she complains about how terrible her life is. <laughs> yeah, this, my sister was like that when she was a kid. Like, everything was awful, no matter what. And any time anything didn't go her way, which was pretty much every day, she would go, my life is ruined! It's like, she didn't get the kind of pizza she wanted. My life is ruined! Um, yeah. Anyway, so I know 
I know what you're talking about here. Um, <laughs> if I don't gossip or participate in gossiping, she rolls her eyes at me. <laughs> she sounds like a really sweet lady. <laughs> The other day I snapped at her for repeatedly calling her girl that dude because she thought she was ugly. She actually called her an ugly man a few times. I don't want to abandon her because I know she is depressed and lonely, but I am at my wit's end. Is it okay to request a move even if it hurts her feelings? Thanks. And it's signed... The note is signed, Sally in Accounting. <laughs> well, there's a few options you have here. One is to practice equanimity. Like, realize you don't need to be drawn into this person's negativity. Uh, she's just making herself miserable. Um, but you don't need to make yourself miserable on account of that. So if she wants to complain about her salad, then you could just smile. Uh, the same way you smile when a car drives by, or the birds start chirping, or the neighbor starts blasting dance music, whatever it is. So you're, you're just like, okay. <laughs> That's her experience, that's okay, but we don't need to take it on. Uh, so just, just keep that little half smile and just like, okay. Uh, as for uh, her rolling her eyes when you don't gossip, that's just hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I, personally I wouldn't be the least bit bothered, I'd probably start laughing. <laughs> you might even try that, just laugh. <laughs> Uh, and as for her thing about referring to another woman as an ugly man, that is admittedly unkind of her, but you don't need to participate, once again. Uh, when she starts going on her, her little aversive rants, um, one, you can just ignore her, uh, just don't respond at all. Uh, eventually she'll get bored of talking when she realizes you're not paying any attention to her. Um, another thing you can do is wait until she's done and then just calmly, peacefully just tell her something like, um, uh, I'm not interested in hearing you insult other people. You might say something like that, but honestly, even that I think is unnecessary. Uh, I think your best option is probably just, just don't get involved. When she starts going on, just don't get involved, just ignore her. Let her ramble on and on, and if at some point she asks you why you're not paying attention, then you can tell her. It's like, well, because I'm not interested in getting involved in, in criticism and insult. It doesn't seem, doesn't seem useful to me. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't recommend snapping at her. Uh, that's, that's just you getting involved in her story. So just don't get involved in her story. That said, we do also need to be practical, uh, recognizing the limits of our current practice. So if this really is too much for your equanimity at this time, then it's okay to request a desk change. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, I mean, as for her getting upset about you requesting a desk change, it sounds like she would get upset about anything. <laughs> um, so I don't think a desk move, uh, if she decides to get upset about that, that's her own choice. It's not, it's not your fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one of the interesting things about life is that we have to deal with other people. <laughs> I like about being a Buddhist monk is I mostly just deal with people who are pretty nice. 
<laughs> Not all the time. <laughs> Every once in a while we do get some jerks in this place, but most people are pretty nice. This one says, I'm new to the Theravada tradition. Two questions below. One, what texts and their translations do you recommend to beginners? Uh, again, as I mentioned before, for a start, reading in the Buddha's words by translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi. That's a good place to start. Um, <coughs> and if you want a canonical text, like sutta text, that's a great place to start. If you just want a general Theravada Buddhist book for beginners, uh, Mindfulness in Plain English by Bhante Ji is a really good one. Uh, the Noble Eightfold Path by Bhikkhu Bodhi is a really good one. Uh, what the Buddha Taught by Walpala Rahula is a good one. Um, yeah. Pretty much anything by Ajahn Shah is a good one. <laughs> Two, there's a lot more techniques that I'm used to in Chan Buddhism. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I got into Theravada is because there's a lot of techniques. I'm afraid of being undisciplined uh, and deciding what technique to use in daily pa practice based on a whim slash what feels easier. Any thoughts? How long would you stick with a given method? Is there some schedule of techniques you'd recommend? Well, first off, don't be afraid of, of being undisciplined. Uh, one of the nice things about Theravada is that you have a number of options. Uh, so, and, and all of these options are wholesome. They're all good. Like, I'm not aware of any Theravada Buddhist meditation technique that is bad or unwholesome. Uh, I mean, there, there are some meditation techniques which aren't useful under certain circumstances. So, for example, if you uh, already hate food and have no interest in eating, then the meditation on the unattractiveness of food is not recommended for you because you're just going to become anorexic, which is not encouraged. Um, or if you're already disgusted by human bodies, then the meditation on the unattractiveness of bodies is also not recommended because it's just going to enhance that aversion and make things worse. Um, but uh, setting aside some very specific examples like that. Generally speaking, most, uh, almost all of the techniques in Theravada Buddhism are more or less universally good. Uh, like, and and uh, most of what I teach is applicable to more or less everyone. It's like I haven't said a single thing during this retreat that I would tell anyone to not do. It's all things that I would recommend to anyone. So you don't need to worry about that. So if it's like, well, today I feel like doing loving kindness, then do loving kindness, that's great. If you're like, well, today I want to develop the perception of impermanence, that's awesome, go for it. All right, today I want to do the four elements meditation, that's cool, go for it. Uh, it's not that, uh, you don't need to worry about uh, doing different things. In fact, I'd recommend that you try out some different techniques and get proficiency with several different techniques. Because different techniques have different effects and different benefits, so it's good to be proficient with several things so that you have a variety of tools to pick from. The other thing is that, generally speaking, we will get more success with a technique that we're interested in. This is another reason why it's useful to have many techniques. Because it's like you wake up one morning and you're like, I just cannot be bothered to do mindfulness of the body right now. <laughs> so it's like, well, if you then try to do mindfulness of the body, it's going to be very challenging because you're already starting off with a strong disinterest. It's going to be hard to get interested. But instead, if you're like, but I do kind of feel like doing some metta, then it's going to be much easier because you're starting off with a strong interest already. Now, one thing that you will learn uh, is you will eventually, hopefully, learn how to produce interest. This is a very useful skill in our meditation practice, the ability to produce interest in the meditation object. Make yourself be interested in your meditation object. This is a tremendously valuable uh, thing with any meditation technique. Make yourself interested in it. Um, 
But again, it's easier to start with something that you're already interested in. So it's, that's perfectly fine. Do what draws you. Uh, but then also make sure you're well-rounded. So I have several different techniques. Um, again, I would say at a bare minimum, loving kindness meditation, some form of physical mindfulness practice. Uh, so mindfulness of the body is what I normally recommend, but other physical mindfulness practices are also fine. And then some form of insight meditation. Uh, so I recommend perception of impermanence or the elements. Uh, but you're welcome to do another one if you prefer. So bare minimum, three techniques. That's absolute bare minimum. So get some proficiency with those three, because that will take you all the way to awakening. Um, yeah, and then just uh, as, as the days go by, uh, use your techniques. Uh, make sure you're not ignoring uh, any one of your, your minimum three. Uh, make sure you're, you're getting at least some experience with each of those. Uh, and every once in a while, go and speak with a, a meditation teacher about what your experiences are and where things are and what they might recommend uh, you consider exploring next. If you want to come up with a schedule for yourself, that's fine. Um, I've never done anything of that sort, but I know some people who do have a schedule like this day I focus on metta, this day I focus on concentration and so on. That's fine. You can try that out and see if it works for you. As for how long you stick with a given method, well, uh, in any one given period, I would say <coughs> When you're first developing proficiency with a meditation method, you really want to spend at least half an hour on it each time, uh, minimum, so that you can really get, get into it and start to get um, a feel for it. And when you're new to a particular technique, you might want to do it every day for several days, or several weeks even, to start to get a sense of, of how it feels, and uh, again, to get some proficiency with it. But those aren't hard and fast rules. Uh, you just try things out and see what happens and see how it goes. Watch your body and mind. So your body and mind is your laboratory. Uh, you do experiments using these meditation techniques and see what happens. And then, again, from time to time, go and talk to, to teachers about what, what your experience is. Three, can someone who is more yoga inclined show us how to stretch during the break? Well, that would not be me. <laughs> my idea of stretching during breaks is to stretch out on my back on my bed. <laughs> but uh, are there any yoga-inclined people who would want to show some stretching to other people? I don't, personally, I don't care one way or another if that's what people want to do. As long as it's silent, I don't mind. My favorite is just standing and just like releasing. I, I didn't mean right now. <laughs> um, you said yes? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so Dana said you can check with her I keep forgetting, is it Dana or Dana? Dana? Okay, sorry, I've been calling you Dana all along You can check with Dana uh, <coughs> When's the next break we have? I've been stretching every day at the evening break so Okay well, there's one more evening break, <laughs> so there's your chance tomorrow evening you can go and stretch with her. <laughs> last stretch of the year. <laughs> In fact, yes. Yeah, I don't have a set regimen, I just, what I tend to do is, at the end of a meditation period, uh, I, I just pay attention to my body, and if there's somewhere in my body that's feeling tense or tight or, or stressed in some way, then I'll do something specifically for that. So for me, it's almost always my shoulders where I start to feel something. So I'll just do a little something for my shoulders. That's pretty much all I do. So I'm really not the best person to talk to about these things. <laughs> 
The other thing is that if your posture is pretty good, you'll find you don't actually have much difficulty. Uh, even if you're doing hours and hours of meditation a day, if your posture is pretty good, you won't have a lot of physical problems. Um, so you won't actually need to do a whole lot of stretching. This one says, mindfulness of the hands slash body doesn't seem to be working for me. Uh, I only came to absorption once last night, then the bell rang. Usually I sit. <laughs> Usually I sit with my hands on thighs. Can I do this instead? My hands feel funny in the circle posture. Um, we'll try out different things and see see what you can do. The main the, there's a number of reasons I recommend the hands. Uh, one of the major reasons why is. Uh, so when holding the hands in your lap, it's, it's very near the center of mass. So it's very near the center of your body. Uh, also, your hands have a ton of nerve endings. So there's a huge amount of sensory data coming through here. So it tends to be one of the most obvious sensations in the body. Uh, so there's a lot more nerve endings in your hands than in, say, your, your calves or your back or something. Mm -hmm. So this tends to be one of the easiest things to focus on. And it's also a very clearly defined area. Uh, so these are all, all reasons why I recommend it. But if you want to have another clearly defined area of your body that you find more easy to focus on, that's okay. As long as it's clear in your mind where the domain is and you keep your attention there. Yeah, if it's just a matter of your hands feeling funny, then I would just look at that. Like, what is that feeling that's being called funny? And so there's probably nothing wrong there except that just that it feels unfamiliar. And so uh, if you're not a fan of things that are unfamiliar, that might be a bit uncomfortable. But it's not inherently uncomfortable. Uh, it just becomes comfortable when we choose to stop resisting it. Next question. I'm disappointed by your answer to the question about systemic racism and white fragility. As a white male monk, it is easy to take the viewpoint that everyone should just work on themselves. But as a white person, I feel a duty to use my privilege to help dismantle systems of oppression. Isn't this engaged Buddhism? I'm a big fan of Theravada, but I think this is where we get a bad rep. Uh, what about the work of Bhikkhu Bodhi and other wonderful organizations? Didn't the Buddha teach generosity and compassion? What if Stan was left to just work on himself? Sometimes we do have power and influence to directly help others. Anyway, I mean no disrespect, and I just hope to keep this dialogue going. Much met down. I was strongly influenced recently by an article that was written by a, uh, a young African-American woman uh, in which she very harshly condemned the, uh, I think she called it the white messiah complex. Uh, the complex that uh, we as white people must use our power and authority to try to uphold and save and protect the lesser non-white people. So she was very harsh towards this attitude. Um, and it really, it really struck me. It really struck me very deeply. It was like, what is going on here? Um, is it possible that uh, what seems, uh, on the one hand, to be a compassionate motive of wanting to help others might actually contain wrapped in uh, a substantial dose of arrogance, self-importance, um, superiority complex. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying that's the case uh, in this particular circumstance, but it's something to look at. So do we have the opportunity to be of benefit to others? Yeah, we do. Should we take that opportunity? Yes. Uh, when we have the opportunity, by all means we should. 
but to be very attentive to uh, the danger of getting caught up in this uh, arrogant superiority complex that can sometimes arise. Um, so I'm not saying, so I, I don't know who wrote this question, so I don't, uh, I can't talk personally about this specific person. Um, yeah, I would just consider that because that really transforms the way I think about these things. Um, yeah, this attitude of like, I am white, therefore I must use my amazing whiteness to benefit other people. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that, that does not feel right to me. <laughs> so yeah, by all means. Do what you can to help dismantle system of, systems of oppression. That's great. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that Buddhism ultimately is a set of tools for changing ourselves. So our practice always must be to change ourselves. That's how it must be. Uh, and uh, one element of changing ourselves is being of benefit to others. So these are not separate things. Our compassion practice is part of working on ourselves. Uh, and in fact, if we're not uh, enacting compassion, then our self-work is um, clearly not particularly effective. Uh, clearly we're not, we're not actually working on ourselves very much. Um, so you mentioned Stan, for example. Uh, the truth is, Stan is left to just work on himself. I can't control his mind. Uh, I wish I could, uh, but I can't. So he has to try to figure these things out on his own, which is quite challenging, because I, I, read, the suttas, I read the suttas to him and he just starts snoring. <laughs> but also, I think that it's, it's actually quite... Uh, it's actually quite illuminating that you are analogizing non-white people to cats, uh, analogizing non-white people to animals. That also indicates, yeah, there's something a bit wrong here. This is, something's not right here. Um, people are just people, and we should treat all people as people. Um, and so if we do look at our minds and we find that we do have uh, racist or prejudiced or discriminatory tendencies, then we should do everything in our power to uproot those tendencies from our mind. If we notice that other people also have such tendencies, then we should do everything we can to convince them that those tendencies are irrational and harmful. Um, so yeah, do what you can. But watch out for this, this white messiah mentality, because this is quite destructive. This is not a good thing. I actually really wish Stan could understand the suttas. <laughs> <laughs> this one says, uh, do you feel you have had to let go of your family because of your Buddhist practice? <laughs> <laughs> do you still see them or keep in touch? I see them every once in a while. Um, the truth is you have to be willing to let go of everything uh, if you wish to make rapid progress. And so usually what it comes is that we start off letting go of a little bit. We let go a little bit. Uh, and when we let, so like Ajahn Chah put it very simply. He said, when you let go a little, you get a little peace. When you let go a lot, you get a lot of peace. When you let go completely, you get complete peace. So that's usually how it goes. We start off letting go a little. Uh, it's just simple things, like we let go of drinking alcohol. We let go of killing people. Uh, we let go... <laughs> um, 
keeping in mind that Stanton is people too. <laughs> <laughs> so that might just mean that you, you give up hunting and fishing. Though hopefully it also means that you give up killing humans. That's a bad thing. Um, so you, 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 it starts with giving up basic things like that. And then you recognize, oh, I'm actually happier. I'm more content. I'm more peaceful. So then we give up a little bit more. Um, we, perhaps we give up our more severe manifestations of greed and, and hatred. Uh, we start to let go of the resentments and grudges that we hold on to. Uh, we start to cultivate uh, contentment with little, instead of always seeking after new things or going on shopping sprees. And we notice, oh, a little more peace. And then maybe we start to give up our vacation time to go on meditation retreats and spend time at monasteries. And we get a little more peace. And then maybe we even do something like we move to another state or another country where we're away from our family for long periods of time, but it's extraordinarily beneficial to our practice. And we find even more peace. So it's that willingness, that willingness to do whatever it takes, the, the willingness to let go of any form of attachment in the pursuit of our practice. So in my case, um, yeah, I see my family, see family members once a year or so. Um, it, it varies, um, but usually at least once a, once a year, I'll see one of my family members. I talk to them from time to time. Like I just talked to my mom on Christmas. Um, uh, my siblings, I communicate with by text fairly regularly. Um, some of my extended family members I'm in contact with from time to time. Um, but yeah, for me it was, it was never a huge thing. Um, I know some people are really attached to their family and it's really hard for them to be away from their family for even short periods of time. Um, that was never an issue for me. Um, so like when I went to live in monasteries, it just wasn't an issue for me. It wasn't something that that held me back in my case. But it's different for different people. Some people are very attached to their family and it's, it's much more challenging for them. Okay, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding the white fragility comment from yesterday. <laughs> Y'all need to just relax. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I have this. Um, I am prone to bouts of self-hatred, and when I am made aware of the harmful actions of the various dominant groups I'm a member of, a lot of self-directed animosity arises. This impedes my developing awareness of harmful actions occurring, my involvement in them, and what I can do to help. From Brahma Vihara practice helps with this, but it is still an obstacle for me. If you have any insight through seeing white fragility from the outside, I would be grateful for your perspective. This is signed, um, but I'm not going to read the name out loud. I will say, though, that I know this person, and I, I'm quite surprised because I don't identify you as even remotely racist. No, I meant to, in the context of the person who wrote the original comment, because I'd never heard of that. And it actually makes a lot of sense for why I don't like hearing specific political messages. Like, I actually oh. have to do a lot of Brahma Vihara practice before I can comfortably and open-mindedly hear a viewpoint that oh. initially I'll take is directed at me, and it'll hurt. Mm. So it's very difficult. Um, well, that's, that's an interesting thing. So, um, first off, just a reminder that we don't do crosstalk during... <laughs> 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 um, in, in this case, that admittedly was useful, but still, let's try to stick to the format of not having crosstalk. Um, yeah, one thing to keep in mind is... So, yeah, a lot of people in the world have done a lot of awful things. Um, but you're not necessarily one of them. So... Other people who look similar to you may have done awful things, but that's not your fault. Um, you, don't, you don't have any part in their karma. Their karma is theirs, not yours. 
we only have our own karma to deal with, our own karma to worry about. As far as I can tell, in the teachings of the Buddha, there is no such thing as group karma. <laughs> there is only individual karma. Every being has their own karma. There is not group karma. Um, so, yeah, in my mind, it's, it's actually quite absurd to have self-hatred because somebody else who looks like you did something bad. Um, it's just, it's silly. Um, you can recognize that they did something <laughs> bad. You can recognize they did something unwholesome. You can n vow not to do similar things. Um, but you don't need to feel guilty about something somebody else did uh, because you didn't do it. It wasn't you. Uh, you also don't need to feel guilty about um, existing discriminatory power structures because you didn't build those structures. Um, you can still do what you can to try to break down those discriminatory structures and to establish equity and fairness. In fact, I highly recommend um, doing what you can to establish equity and fairness. But you don't need to feel guilty because you didn't do it. Yeah, I mean, I don't even recommend feeling guilty about what you yourself do, let alone feeling guilty about what other people do. Um, even when it's something you yourself have done, the, the response is not to be guilt. The response is conscience. The response is to recognize that was unwholesome. I will not do that. There doesn't need to be guilt. There's just a recognition of right and wrong and a commitment to do what's right. Guilt doesn't need to enter into the picture at all. As far as I can tell, guilt is an unwholesome emotion. It's not a good one. It's on the, it's on the side of the unwholesome. The other issue here also is a matter of self-identity. Uh, it's because you think, I am a white male. Therefore, uh, you identify as a member of that group. Therefore, what other members of that group then uh, reflects on your self-identity. So drop the self-identity. That's not absolutely who you are. It's just the current conditions of body and mind. Next question. Another landmine? <laughs> In the sutta where the guy becomes a stream enterer and dies, he heard a very important teaching and obviously understood the words and meaning. If somebody fully understands the Four Noble Truths, experiences non-duality, the non-abiding state, deathlessness, practices the Four States of the Brahma Viharas, but does not believe or understand the parallel universes or devas existing, can a person become a stream enterer still because those beliefs do not matter to the awakened state? So the trouble here is that um, one needs to have a certain degree of right view, of right perspective, of correct understanding, uh, in order to attain stream entry. And one critical element of right view is, an under is karma. So understanding, uh, at the very least, accepting karma. Accepting that we experience the consequences of our own choices and that every choice we make will result in consequences that we eventually experience. <laughs> the basic understanding of, of causality, uh, of moral cause and effect. And the thing is that once we accept karma, when we ponder the implications of karma, then we inevitably arrive at rebirth, devas, and other worlds. Inevitably. It's inescapable. I'm not going to walk you through the steps right now, but if you, if you reflect on it, you'll recognize that this is inevitable. Um, 
that said, uh, the attainment of stream entry specifically involves, at its most basic, it involves a recognition that one is not the five khandas, one is not body and mind. Um, it's a recognition that, uh, and, and it's the, the severance of doubt. So one no longer has any doubt in the Buddhist teachings. So that also includes the teachings about rebirth, the teachings about karma, and the teachings about other worlds and devas. So there's no doubt uh, about those things. So it may not be specifically on your mind when you attain awakening. You might not be specifically thinking about other universes, but it's included within the, the general mm, constellation of things that one no longer has doubt about. Yeah, basically, once you recognize, once you accept karma fully, uh, a whole giant package of things comes along with karma. And it's all like really wonderful stuff. Like, it's, uh, it's, it's actually really lovely how all the different pieces of samsara fit together so perfectly. Uh, I mean, it's lovely and it's terrible at the same time. But, uh, on this occasion, let's emphasize the lovely side. It's really lovely how it all fits together. <laughs> um, and once you get a glimpse of that, you're just like, oh, naturally. Of course that's how it is. Couldn't be any other way. One, you said there is currently an enlightened one. Who is this? <laughs> how does one know or verify if that person is enlightened? I'm actually aware of a few who are uh, rumored to be enlightened. So one of the challenges here is that unless you have the ability to read minds, you can't know for sure who's enlightened or who, or who isn't. However, generally speaking, you can tell someone isn't enlightened. <laughs> I've known a lot of people who are clearly not enlightened. <laughs> um, I've also met a couple of people who were rumored to be enlightened, and I didn't see anything to contradict that. Doesn't mean for sure that they were, but I didn't see anything to contradict it. So one complicating factor here is that enlightened beings, generally speaking, don't brag about it. Um, in fact, usually they don't, they don't specifically talk about it, but they'll talk about it in roundabout ways. One example of this is Ajahn Liam, uh, Lung Po Liam. Mm. Um, you know of him? I haven't seen him, like in a picture. Oh, I've, I've met him. He's, <laughs> some he's time, really special. Some Thai friend will show me the picture that she has been seeing him. Yes. Uh, and Tip, you said you, you've met him or know of him? No? Okay. Anyway, he's really special. So, uh, I, I lived in the same monastery as him for a month, and during that month I didn't see anything that showed he had any defilements. So most people, you watch them for a month, and you will see many, 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 many examples. Um, so even my beloved preceptor is, I, I dearly adore him and respect him, and he's an extremely well-developed monk, and he's very wise. Um, but I remember the first time I, I saw something in his face, and I was just like, oh, he's not quite all the way. But that was... <laughs> He's a great guy, though, and a really awesome teacher. So I, I still highly recommend him. Um, so Ajahn Pasano, uh, the abbot of Abhayagiri Monastery. He's amazing. Highly recommended. Um, and he might be enlightened now. I don't know. I haven't seen him in a few years. <laughs> anyway, but I never saw anything in Ajahn Liam that uh, made me think he wasn't enlightened. Uh, and there was... Uh, there's also a... Uh, there was a talk he gave, and it's recorded in one of the books up there, and I can't remember which one, but there was a talk he gave where he never directly uses the words arhant or enlightened or awakened, but he just talks about his experiences. 
And you read between the lines and eventually it becomes clear that he is implicitly stating that he's attained awakening. He's implying that he's an Arhat. He never comes directly out and says, I am an Arhat. But it's, he says it in every other possible way without directly stating it. So uh, him, I think it's pretty likely. It's pretty likely. Uh, a couple other monks who I've encountered who um, were rumored to, uh, I found a bit less impressive, but uh, with them also I didn't see anything in particular to contradict the rumor. But I also spent a lot less time with them, so it's hard to say for sure. Uh, one of them is Ajahn Anan. Ajahn Anan Akinchino uh, is rumored to be enlightened, and yeah, he could be. He's an impressive character. Um, there's, there's a handful of others that I'm aware of, but those are the two most well-known ones. Two, suggestion. Might be wise to have no open-air containers in meditation hall. I've noticed three spills already. <laughs> so, uh, see, originally I was actually saying we should replace these cups because they have a narrow bottom, which means they knock over easily. But it's also great mindfulness training. Let's see, three. Um, in Southeast Asia, pointing feet at the Buddha and lying down in meditation hall are considered no-no. Is that cultural? Why is that rule not followed here? Yeah, it is cultural. Um, so as I understand it, in Southeast Asia, pointing your feet at anything is considered disrespectful. But that's just not a thing in, in Western culture. It's like nobody thinks anything of it. Like if you sit down with your feet pointed towards someone, they're not going to be upset or disturbed at all. In fact, it probably won't even occur to them. Um, so it's just not a thing in this culture, so I've never made a thing out of it. Because uh, another reason why is like the more rules you have, the less people follow them. Um, so, yeah. so, one of the principles that we started this retreat center with was to have as few rules as possible, and that the rules we have would be rules that were important. And so things that are actually really important. So if this retreat center was in Southeast Asia, we probably would have that rule, because in that culture it makes sense. Um, in this culture it's just not a thing. Um, so it didn't make sense to make a thing of it. It's also not universal in all Buddhist cultures, it's only in some. Um, so also since this is a non-sectarian center that has teachers from many different traditions and different cultures, it didn't make sense to come down in, in favor of any one particular culture or any one particular tradition. Um, as for lying down in the meditation hall, Yeah, don't do it during Dhamma Talks. <laughs> uh, I mean, during break times, I don't particularly mind so much because, um, uh, again, we only have a certain amount of space in this house. Uh, so if, if you want to lie down in here during a break time, I don't particularly have anything wrong with that. But yeah, not during the Dhamma talks, not during the meditation periods. Four. If everything that has a beginning has an end, then humans will also cease to exist. In some countries, like the UK and Japan, the population is shrinking. Scientists suspect that human population globally will not only stop growing, but also start shrinking, probably in our lifetime. If that's the case, how or what life forms will unawakened beings be reborn into? So as I mentioned before, there are uncountable worlds, many, 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 many worlds, uh, like a ridiculously huge number of them. There's one sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya where the Buddha says there's a hundred thousand worlds like this one. There's a hundred thousand heavens, a hundred thousand hells, a hundred thousand world systems. Um, and the, the word 100,000 here is not meant to be a, 
uh, an upper limit. It's just meant to be a really huge number. Um, so back in those days, they didn't have the gigantically huge numbers that we have these days. So even the even like the number 100,000 is exceedingly rare in the Pali Canon. It's pretty rare that you see any number bigger than a thousand, actually. Um, so the Buddha saying a hundred thousand of something would be kind of like someone saying like a, uh, I don't know, what's Google a really big number? Google. Yeah, yeah, like Googleplex. It's just like a fantastically gigantic number. Um, in the in the Mahayana Sutras, there's even bigger numbers, um, to the point where they eventually just wind up saying a sankhya, which just means incalculable. Like there's so many, it's incalculable. Uh, there's so many you can't count. Um, so, will humans on this planet eventually go extinct? Yeah. But that's fine because there's lots of other ones. Um, so, if it's your karma to be born as a human, then you'll be born as a human on another world. If there's no human bodies on this world, then you'll just be reborn on another one where there are human bodies available. So, you don't need to worry about that. <laughs> the other thing to keep in mind is that humans have gone extinct innumerable times. So, it's just the nature of all things being impermanent. Um, every now and then, uh, in some place, at some time, uh, a species of humans comes into being, and it lasts for a while, and then eventually it dies out. Sometimes it dies out relatively quickly, sometimes it takes a long time, sometimes they spread beyond one planet and colonize multiple planets and multiple solar systems, sometimes they don't. In our case, it's looking unlikely, we'll probably wipe ourselves out long before we get off this planet. Um, but that's okay, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Uh, so don't worry about it. Um, it's, the human race never entirely disappears because there's always other worlds in samsara. So any one particular world might not, might not have humans on it, but that's not a problem. person says, is the four-hour meditation really four hours long? <laughs> You'll find out, won't you? <laughs> Are you trying to kill us? <laughs> One, no. I'm trying to help you attain awakening. And two, I'm not asking you to do anything I haven't done myself many, 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 many times. I don't teach things that I haven't done myself, extensively and thoroughly. So I'm not experimenting on you. <laughs> I'm teaching you things that I have learned, taken to heart, practiced thoroughly, and gained substantial benefit from. Um, Uh, the sixth one here is a long rambling thing about using the bathroom, which I'm not going to read out loud because it's clearly silly and pointless. <laughs> Next question. Is it correct to say that the Dharmakaya and the awakened mind are one and the same? So you want to talk about the Dharmakaya. <laughs> First off, just to be clear that Dharmakaya as a cosmological concept, particularly discussed in Mahayana Buddhism, um, doesn't have anything to do with Dhammakaya as the, the particular sect found in Thailand. So just so we're clear right off from the start. So Dharmakaya, uh, in, uh, as it's talked about in Mahayana cosmology, Dharmakaya is the... Mm. Uh, 
called like the the truth body of the Buddha or the the true body of the Buddha, the the absolute body of the Buddha, like the um, the mind and body of the Buddha, which has no no limitations or restrictions. So they talk about three three forms of Buddha. Um, so Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nirmanakaya. So Nirmanakaya is a Buddha in human form, um, walking amongst us. He looks like a human. He talks like a human. He acts like a human. Um, so, for example, Gotama Buddha, when he was around 2,500 years ago, uh, was Nirmanakaya Buddha. So Buddha manifesting as a human body. Um, and so that's the form of Buddha that we're, we're normally familiar with. Uh, Sambhogakaya is a Buddha in, as I understand it, in the form of a deva, uh, which is possible um, for various reasons. I'm not going to go, going to go into that. Um, so the, that's the so Nirmanakaya means the manifestation body. So it's the Buddha manifesting as a human being, uh, and Sambhogakaya is the enjoyment body. So it's a Buddha in a, a completely pleasant or enjoyable state. Um, and there's reasons why Buddhas can be present in, in Deva worlds. The simple reason why is because Devas also need to attain enlightenment. Um, so they also need instruction. Um, and then there's the, the Dharmakaya. So the Dharmakaya is the absolute mind. So that's the mind which encompasses all things, which is not limited by any particular form. So the important thing here is that uh, Dharmakaya Buddha is completely impersonal. So it's more like the principle of the awakened mind. Uh, it's the awakened mind which all of us tap into, which all of us have the, uh, which all of us has the, have the ability to access. So Nirmanakaya is a specific Buddha, but Dharmakaya is non-specific. It's, it's universal. Um, so it's also sometimes called the universal Buddha. There's also other ways of talking about Sambhogakaya Buddha, by the way. So talking about Sambhogakaya as a um, cosmic manifestation of a Nirmanakaya Buddha. But I'm, I'm not going to get into that because it gets very... Um, again, there's debate. Um, and the debate is, is really pointless. It's beside the point in this case. So mostly we're just going to talk about Dharmakaya and Nirmanakaya. Um, so Nirmanakaya is specific Buddhas. Dharmakaya is the universal principle of Buddhahood. So the universal Buddha mind, the universal awakened mind. Um, so technically speaking, when anyone attains awakening, at that point they're experiencing Dharmakaya Buddha. They're experiencing the universal awakened mind. Okay? <laughs> Did we get that? Did that make sense? Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a good example of something which is, um, it's not directly addressed anywhere in the Pali Canon, um, but the, the, in the Mahayana Sutras, we find a lot of things fleshed out in detail which are only hinted at or implied in the Pali Canon. So this concept of Dharmakaya Buddha and Nirmanakaya Buddha is something which doesn't in any way conflict with anything in the Pali Canon, and it provides a very handy way of explaining and accessing and discussing um, certain subjects uh, related to awakening. Um. I could say a lot more on that subject, but we'll set it aside for now. This one says, Sometimes it's difficult for me to get through books on religion. As you explored Buddhism and meditation, did you find it easier to study, learn, and retain information? Um, the thing is that when you're interested in something, then it's easy. If you're not interested, then it's not easy. Um, so, for example, when I was in college, I had to study a lot of things I wasn't remotely interested in. So it was very difficult to motivate myself to study it, or to learn it, or to retain any of it. In fact, I've forgotten pretty much all of it. 
Um, but Buddhism I was very deeply interested in, so it was a joy to study it. Uh, and I had no difficulty retaining it, because it was something I placed a lot of importance on. And therefore it made a very strong mark on my mind. Next question. What are your thoughts on Tonglen versus Metta meditation? I find Tonglen easier. Uh, well, they're somewhat different uh, in uh, both in methodology and also in purpose and application. So I should admit that I don't personally have a lot of experience with Tonglen. Uh, I've done some Tonglen when we've had Tibetan Buddhist teachers here teaching it. So it's a, it's a method found in Tibetan Buddhism that's primarily for the development of compassion. Uh, it also helps to uh, push the limits of what one is willing to tolerate. So it's a way of finding our comfort zone and pushing the edges of our comfort zone a bit. Um, and uh, it also incorporates elements of not-self. Um, so I'm really, I'm really not the best person to talk about it because it's not something that I've explored extensively myself. But there is there's a subtle difference, well not very subtle difference there, like metta meditation is very simple, pure and direct. Uh, it's just about universal unconditional love, that's it. Tonglin is a bit more complicated, it's about producing compassion, compassion specifically being the wish for beings to be free of suffering. Um, and it's also, uh, again, about seeing to what extent are we willing to experience uh, suffering for the benefit of others. So it's wrapping in this thing of like, how far are we willing to push our limits for the benefit of others? So, yeah, it's, they, they don't line up very well against each other because they're quite different practices. They're similar in that both of them are ways of producing wholesome mind states, but they're, they're quite different, so I would not put them side by side. By the way, my go-to metta image is the... Uh, I can't actually read this word. Oh, the unconditional, the unconditional love I felt for my young children. I still love my kids, but it is more complicated as they get older. <laughs> then visualize them as they were when they were young. So, with metta practice, our goal... Go ahead and let it out. <laughs> uh, with metta practice, our goal is to produce metta. So it doesn't necessarily need to be using uh, a person as they presently are, um, nor does it necessarily need to be using someone who's alive, um, or someone we know personally, or even necessarily someone who's real. Uh, not, I mean, not that anyone is quite real. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean. Uh, so, use whatever works. Um, you might try then, yeah, bringing up what they were like when they were young. Visualize them when they were young, uh, when your feelings were more pure. Uh, and then what you'll find though is that then as your metta becomes stronger and deeper, then you can start to, to have metta for them as they are, as well as how they used to be. This is also relevant because sometimes people ask if it's okay to do metta for dead people. And yeah, that's totally fine. Um, it's, some metta teachers will say that you should not do metta for dead people, but if it helps you get metta, then it's good. Um, it's the metta itself that matters. It's the feeling of loving kindness. It's the attitude of loving kindness that matters. Not so much how we get there. Next question. I was in an unreal amount of pain during tonight's sit. 
and I started chanting Namo Amitabha Buddha in order to get through it without breaking posture. Could you talk about taking refuge as a meditative practice? I find it helpful when my self-power runs out, but part of me fears that it is escapism. Um, yeah, every now and then I'll, I'll chant. Uh, there's one that I particularly like, Namo Dabe Guanshari Yen Pusa. I just dearly adore that one, so I'll use that one from time to time. Uh, you know the one I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with this. Uh, in fact, it seems perfectly fine to me. Um, yeah, recollection of the Buddha. It's, it's one of the things that the, the Buddha himself recommended as a meditation technique, recollection of the Buddha. Uh, or recollection of the Buddha's qualities. Um, so recollection of the Buddha doesn't necessarily mean Gautama Buddha. It can be any Buddha. Um, recollection of qualities of a Buddha uh, in my mind, recollection of bodhisattvas is not, not much off from that. Uh, it's in the same category. Uh, so I find bringing to mind uh, Avalokiteshvara, um, Guan Yin, uh, I find that quite helpful at times. It just really softens the mind. It softens the mind, it brings up, uh, brings up courage, brings up confidence, brings up dedication. Yeah, it's a really good thing. Recollection of the Buddha is remarkably effective um, at reminding us. Uh, and yeah, it brings up a whole constellation of wholesome qualities. Um, it depends upon already having a certain measure of faith. Uh, so one needs to already have some measure of faith. Uh, in the Buddha, or faith in, in bodhisattvas, in order for it to be effective. Like, if you, don't, if you don't believe in the existence of Amitabha Buddha, then chanting Namo Amitabha Buddha is extraordinarily unlikely to be helpful. <laughs> um, if you don't believe Gotama Buddha was enlightened, uh, then recollecting Gotama Buddha is also not going to be remotely helpful. Um, but if you already have some faith in Buddha, uh, then it can be extremely powerful to bring it to mind. It really transforms the mind. Yeah, it's not escapism. Uh, it's completely valid. Oh, this one just says thank you. Uh, I think there's something inside if I can figure out how to unfold it. <laughs> Okay, I think some people are really bored. <laughs> How do you think about monks taking money directly from people? Uh, did the Buddha say anything about it? So, uh, that, that gets into the issue of, of vinya, of the monastic rules of conduct. Um, so, uh, and that's a complicated issue for many reasons. Um, so, during the course of the Buddha's life, they were, uh, when he initially started the monastic order, there were no rules. Uh, it was just understood that people had a sincere commitment to being good people and to trying to attain awakening. So there wasn't any need to have rules because people were already following a, a high standard of, of moral purity. But then as there came to be more monks and nuns, then they started doing silly things and the Buddha started making rules. Um, so when monks started killing people, the Buddha said, okay, don't kill people. <laughs> um, when monks started stealing things, the Buddha said, okay, stop stealing things. Uh, so he made rules in response to specific cases. So there was a rule he specifically made about, about monastics not uh, receiving money. And the reason for that was because 
Um, so in, in the Buddhist time, uh, all, uh, all Buddhist monastics were beggars. Um, so they uh, relied upon the gifts of others to survive. Um, so they would go into a village in the morning with their bowl and people would give them food to eat. When their robes got torn up, then people would give them cloth to patch their robes or to make new robes. When they were sick, people would give them medicine uh, and so on. Um, and it was just understood, that was the relationship. Like, uh, people would take care of the monastics, uh, make sure the monastics were able to survive. Um, and the monastics would uh, teach what they learned in their practice to support the lay people in their practice as well. Uh, and so it was just understood, it was a symbiotic relationship uh, of helping each other. Um, and uh, But then the incident that led to the making of the rule about money was because uh, there was a, a group of monks who would, they would go to a particular shop and the shopkeeper there would, would give them some, some things, I forget exactly what it was, it was food or some other supplies of some sort. Uh, but then one of the other monks uh, started receiving money and he went into the shop and he started buying things. So then when the monks who were not using money came to the shop, the shopkeeper was like, why should I give you anything for free? The other monks pay for what they have. Why don't you pay for what you want? And they were like, well, because we don't have any money. We're, we're beggars. We're alms mendicants. We just live in the forest. We don't have any money. Uh, but the shopkeeper was having none of it. So word got back to the Buddha, and so the Buddha made, made a rule about not receiving money because uh, he didn't want to see this relationship of mutual support breaking down. Uh, because that gets into, that becomes quite harmful. Uh, it would mean that then monks and nuns would have to get jobs and start earning money mm -hmm. and buying things, and, and, and so it meant that they wouldn't have as much time to devote to their spiritual practice. Uh, they would just basically be lay people with funny outfits and no hair. <laughs> so he was like, well, that's not really what I had in mind here. Um, so uh, in order to prevent that from happening, he made a rule about not using money. Um, he did set up a number of provisions, like you can have, uh, monastics can have lay people who keep money for them and uh, buy things using uh, to support them and so on. Um, but then at the end of his life, the Buddha said that it's not necessary to keep all the rules. He said it's only necessary to keep the major ones, but not the minor ones. Um, and this has been a great source of debate for the intervening 2,500 years. <laughs> which, which ones are major and which ones are minor? Um, and uh, so the current situation is that Probably about 99% of Buddhist monastics do receive money uh, for one reason or another. Um, some don't, uh, so trying to keep, keep strictly to that, that precept. Uh, and the main reason for keeping strictly to that precept is that it prevents the arising of greed and attachment. Um, so when we start stockpiling money, then we start thinking, ooh, what can I get with this? <laughs> Um, or we get very attached to it. We're like, oh, I, I don't want to lose my money. Uh, we start to get fearful, uh, worried. Um, and so the, the rise of this, this greed, attachment, and fear uh, is quite, quite destructive. So there's a lot of value to, to following that precept. But there's also value to being practical. Um, so, um, so personally, uh, for... The vast majority of situations, I don't handle money, I don't use money, I don't do anything with money as part of my own practice. But every now and then there's circumstances where that's just not practical. Um, so in those circumstances, it's like, well, I'm going to be practical uh, because otherwise certain things just aren't possible. Um, uh, another thing also has to do with, with kindness. So I've I've seen it happen where, uh, so a lay person came and, and they, they had an envelope and the envelope probably had some money in it and they really wanted to give it to the monk and the monk was like, no, 
I don't <coughs> touch that. Take it away. And the lay person got really upset. Like the lay person came and they're trying to be generous. And the monk is like, disgusting. <laughs> and, and so, uh, of course, <laughs> uh, so not only does that offend the person, but it also damages that person's sense of generosity and of the importance of generosity. Um, so in those circumstances, then, I actually say, like, the, thing, the proper thing to do is to receive it. But you receive it with the mind, um, this is not for me. Uh, this is for the support of Buddhism. Um, and so then you make sure it goes to supporting Buddhism one way or another. Um, so in this case, uh, if someone wants to give me money, then I'll tell you, just donate it to the organization. Uh, I don't have any use for money, just give it to the organization. I actually need very little. If you want to know exactly what I need, I'll tell you, and you can get me exactly what I need. <laughs> but if you just want to give me money, don't, don't bother. Just give it to the organization. Um, but there's, there's one elderly gentleman I know who, he just doesn't get this. Um, and he really, really, really insists on handing it directly to me. And I'm like, okay, fine. If this is what makes you happy, then you can hand it directly to me. I'm okay with that. Um, I don't keep it, I just pass it on to somebody who can put it to good use, uh, who, can, who can use it to support the organization. Um, so it's, uh, again, it's important to keep in mind that the, the Vinaya rules were established in order to support our practice. Um, so it's, it's always keeping in mind that ultimately it's doing what's to the greatest strength of our practice. So, so in the case, for example, of this elderly gentleman, it's recognizing that compassion for this, this sweet, adorable, generous old man um, is more important than holding strictly to the letter of a particular rule. So I can still keep the spirit of the rule and that um, I'm not interested in the money and I'm not keeping it. But uh, respecting this, this old man and being kind to him uh, in this one small way. So uh, to come back to your question, how do I think about monastics taking money directly from people? It all depends on what's going on in their mind. It depends on the reason why they're doing that. For example, I'm also thinking of a, a really lovely uh, Sri Lankan monk who lives near here, uh, Bhante Nanda, who I just I adore him. Some of you have met him. Um, is he not totally awesome? Okay, that was way less enthusiasm than I was hoping for. Okay, she agrees, he's awesome. She agrees, he's awesome. She agrees, he's awesome. Um, so he runs a temple by himself. That means he has to do a lot of things by himself. That means sometimes he has to make purchases to keep his meditation center running. So as I see it, he's doing something extraordinarily wholesome. He's not spending, his, he's not spending the money on Porsches and big screen TVs. Um, he's spending the money on running a meditation center that provides free meditation programs. That is totally awesome. I fully support that. So in that case, it's very clear to me, like he's not He's not receiving money out of selfishness. He's receiving it out of selflessness. He's receiving it out of compassion, out of his wish to help other beings attain awakening. So again, it's, it's all about the attitude and the mind. Two, um, in the history of Buddha, does it say anything about whether women can be uh, bhikshunis? Uh, it is female monks. Um, yeah, the Buddha said. The Buddha said that women can be bhikshunis. Women can be uh, female monks. Um, and so, in in uh, in some Buddhist countries, uh, it was just never a problem. Like there's been monks and nuns right from the beginning. So, like in China, in Taiwan, uh, Vietnam, Korea. Um, there's always been both monks and nuns, and it just hasn't been a problem. Uh, in fact, these days there's far more nuns than there are monks. Uh, so they are uh, bhikshunis outnumber bhikshus uh, something like five to one. It's by by quite a large margin. Um, in other Buddhist countries, uh, Burma, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Tibet, uh, the bhikshuni order died out 
uh, hundreds of years ago. Um, and uh, in, recent, in recent years, there's been attempts to revive it or restore it uh, through various methods. The most direct one just being to get ordained in Taiwan or China, uh, which I don't see any problem with because it all comes from the Buddha. Uh, whether someone is a nun in Taiwan or a nun in um, Korea or a nun in um, Sri Lanka or a nun in Nepal, it doesn't matter. Um, it, their lineage goes back to the Buddha, uh, so it's a valid lineage. Um, so yeah, I'm fully on board. Three, have you been to any Asian country? Uh, just recently I was in Taiwan. It was awesome. I really, really loved it. Uh, eventually I'd like to visit every Buddhist country. Um, as it becomes possible. So there's limitations on what makes these things possible. But uh, eventually, yeah, I'd like to visit every Buddhist country. Uh, uh, I'm not quite clear what this says. What have you been, see, and learn about Buddha? I'm not quite clear what this is asking. Um, Uh, well, I mean, if you're asking how I started learning about, about Buddhism, it was, in, it was in this country, so reading things on the internet. Uh, and that was really what got me started. I just, uh, I came across some Buddhist teachings on the internet, some teachings about meditation practice, and uh, it really appealed to me. It really, it really struck a chord for me. So I started practicing meditation um, and studying Buddhist philosophy, and it just very quickly... Uh, took over my life. It very quickly became uh, the most important thing in my mind. So that within within a couple of years, I decided to be a monk. Uh, it, was, it was very quick. It was it just felt so natural to me. And like when I started studying Buddhism, it was just very natural. It was just like, yeah, of course, this is the way. Okay, another paper airplane. <laughs> In fact, this is creative. Um, it also has little Thai characters written on it, so that definitely <laughs> narrows down who wrote this. <laughs> uh, it says, first, thank you, Ajahn, and the meditation talk with wonderful place. So Ajahn is the, the Thai word for teacher which comes from the, the Pali word acharya, which also means teacher. I'm glad you like this place. I like it too. Uh, and second, thank you for my good friend who brought me here. I, I have arrived. I am home. I don't know who your good friend is, but I'm happy they brought you here too. I have some guesses. <laughs> I have been looking for my home and where my real happiness is for 33 years, but now I found it. I have been confused, lost, uh, I fell, but uh, I do get up and keep walking. It makes me stronger, but I am still weak and confused, and now I am awake as knowing. Now is the knowing right here. Uh, the truth is you, your home is you. Uh, meditation helps me a lot, and the light is shining, uh, and always... Uh, tomorrow is our last day here. Um, let's feel at home together and start a new chapter of a happy life. That's really sweet. Yeah, that's adorable. Oh, it says, please read his last... Oops, I was supposed to read this as the last one. Oops. Sorry. Sorry. Hopefully this won't be another disturbing landmine question. <laughs> no, this one's fine. Uh, what about a rubber band ball as a metaphor for feelings and plantain leaves? 
I know it's not a plant, but rubber band balls bounce around rooms like crazy and can drive you nuts, similar to feelings. <laughs> Whatever works. <laughs> and, and similarly, if you just keep peeling off rubber bands, eventually there's nothing there. So, yeah, whatever works. Okay, that's it for Q&A for tonight. Um, so let's go ahead and do some stand-